welcome to Video Church. Now, before we get started, I wanted to introduce you to my family altar. You see, lots of people don't have what we call a family altar. They have this idea that they don't need to be religious, so they don't put religious items in their home. So if you visited their house, it would be interesting to find out where they're, or whether they have a man cave, whether they are into using a living room, you know, with a dining room table that they sit down to eat dinner with, you know, like a family does. Because a lot of times what we choose to do in our home and in our family life actually reveals a lot about our spiritual home and our spiritual life. Oftentimes we can hide the fact of who we are until we get behind closed doors. But can't we actually hide who we are, what we are, or how we are from God? I don't think so. So today we're going to look at a scripture that's pretty important for all of us. You might want to get a Bible in order to read it and maybe read ahead on it. It's in Romans chapter 12. And the primary focus that God gave me before I read the entire chapter was verse 1, which I don't only memorize the location of the scripture, but God gives me sometimes in topical studies the direction that he wants to go, and then all of the inflection or reality of how to apply it is between my relationship with the Holy Spirit and God choosing to use me by the Spirit of God within me. And so we're looking at, in verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of our God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So that's where we're going to be. And that's where we're going to study today to look at as soon as I find my Bible. So get settled, get ready, and let's go through Romans chapter 12 today. Shall we? Let's get some water, maybe. Oh, and by the way, in case you hadn't noticed, we're inside, not outside. You see, most people that uh, have been with us with Video Church, they remember us being outside and being Utah's only all outdoor church. Since I got back from the Mississippi River about four weeks ago, I've been looking at locations because we've moved from Bountiful to Salt Lake City. Oh, by the way, I'm wearing shorts, so if you get offended because I'm wearing my cutoffs or my shorts, oh well. <laughs> I'm known to wear a coat and wear shorts, even socks. But being a hippie from the Southern California days and then being saved during the Jesus movement, I pretty much don't care about what's on the outward manifestation of who I am, but I care what God is doing on the inward man as I grow up into him in all things. And so when I got back from the Mississippi River in order to honor that ministry that God has given me to be the preacher at Video Church, I began to look around as we moved to Salt Lake City for locations to film outside. We we're praying about getting a video camcorder and using that with its tele microphone, hopefully, to um, do what we had been doing previously, which was on Sundays and maybe Wednesdays or whatever church day we choose to record video, video devotionals for video church. We have quite a few Bible series going on that we'll continue on in and produce them with Hummingbird Productions, the intro and the exit, meaning that there'll be some music or dance or worship in the forepart or the front of sometimes the Bible study. And there'll also maybe be a summation at the end of the tape or the video that will either be poignant in its message or completing that with which had been taught within the service itself or the preaching that God allows me to give in that particular topic, time, or place, or location. So really all of these recordings that are becoming on the internet pretty popular, they are going to be produced now with the Vidivo intro and the Vidivo exit. So today, let's as it were, put on our thinking caps or put on our 
nice shiny faces all in our places. My wife tells me this kind of nursery rhyme about some kind of romper room or something like that. I'm not really sure what it is. But putting on my glasses so that I can read, you know, I dug out my old open Bible from the early days of the Jesus movement, the original one, not the revived version or the later, you know, editions. But, you know, it's pretty banged up and beat up. But I just like to start off with putting you in remembrance of the former things that were so that we can look at the things that are and then understand the things which shall be. That is a scripture, by the way, and in case you don't recognize it, you'll find that I will speak a lot of the Word of God in my vocabulary as I discuss things with you, causing you maybe to be provoked in your inner man that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, He who raised Jesus from the dead, might cause you to recognize some phrase or some saying or some teaching, as it were, from the Bible that will instruct you in the way you should go. That will be God speaking to you by His Spirit, becoming the Word of God to the people of God, that they might understand they're hearing God's voice, not the voice of a man preaching to them some pre-prepared -pre 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 notes and sermon topics and logic and all the other junk that a lot of well, religious people do, which is okay, and some evangelicals and a lot of other people do. As far as putting to paper the preparation of the outlines or making an exegetical study, oh sure, I could do that. But God never said to. You see, God gave us the ability to think, to reason, to rationalize, to compromise, to lie, to cheat, to steal, or to turn it over, as it were, in our ministry to the Father. As the song goes, turn it over to the Son, turn it over to the Spirit, you know, the three in one. And that was a song we used to sing in the Jesus movement. Turn it over to the Father, turn it over to the Son, and turn it over to the Spirit. Do -do -do -do. Three in one. But anyways, you get it. Nowadays, with the millennial generation having come along, and the Gen Xers, and now the Armageddon generation, the last generation, we see three or four generations since the Jesus movement treating some of the things that I learned as nursery rhymes or Sunday school songs that, bluntly, I'd like to see how well they memorize the Bible because I know my Word of God very succinctly because almost everything I worshiped with was the Bible put to music. Just the way it was, just the way I think it should be, and just the way it shall be in heaven. Because in reality, a lot of what we think of as conversation in heaven probably goes on in communication in a songful way, as a soul being expressed unto God by their spirit. So, when I look to the understanding of wisdom, I find that without there being God in you, God in me, we can't communicate one to another. You see, there's this truth that we find spiritually evident, but not self-evident. Because, you know, if it was self-evident, everybody would know it. And, frankly, the Constitution is not, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Those men that wrote it came up with a nice phrase, but truth is not self-evident. And neither is the Word of God self -evident determined or self-realized. In reality, it has to be divinely inspired to your comprehension. In other words, there has to come to you that which comes from above, dare I say, the Spirit of God. He has to come down inside you to open your eyes to comprehend what's before you, to give you the ability to hear exactly what God wants you to know so that you will recognize that it's the Word of God speaking and spoken to you, made alive by the Spirit of God, so that you could become the people of God, learning about the Son of God, Jesus, and you would be no longer Jew or Gentile, male or female, but sons and daughters of God growing up into the likeness of Jesus. That's why a lot of times, as we're going to discuss it in this study today, 
when you start talking about politics, when you start talking about nationalism, you know, patriotism, like you, you know, flag salute or you put your hand over your heart, those aren't Christian expressions. That's not fealty to God. That's loyalty to a nation. That's loyalty to an idealism that is something that compromises really what we're all about. Jesus said that my kingdom is not of this world. Oh, thank God. And he said, if the kingdom were of this world, then my disciples would fight for it. That ought to be letting some people know that you should not be involved in fights. I mean, no offense, but your war ideas and your violent ideas really are anti-Christian, not as a process of being a Christian and serving your country. I mean, sometimes you hear the words, you know, and it kind of goes, well, there's something wrong with that expression, but I don't know what it is. Let me think about that for a minute. Serving my country. I think we're going to find, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of our God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Oh, oh, service. You want me to serve God, not man. Well, all I can tell you is this. If you try to put the onus on me, meaning that I'm the one supposedly selling and saying and telling you what to do, then you've already failed the litmus test of being a spiritual Christian. You see, God has to reveal to you what he wants you to do. What wants you to do. In other words, I can tell you what the Word says, but unless God applies it to your life, it doesn't matter what the Bible says. It matters what God reveals to you as necessary for your spiritual life and your eternity, your eternal existence, your, as I call it, eternality. Meaning that the reality of your existence doesn't end when this physical body dies, but you continue on into a place where there is no time and there is no death anymore. Dare I say that that can be, for some, hell, and for others, heaven, which shall be changed, eventually, into something new, but you'll still be eternal torment or eternal blessing. Dare I say it wasn't because of man and his sin that this was created, but rather for angels who had fallen from why they were created, rebelled against their own creator, and determined for themselves their own eternal destiny. Mankind, in his own choices, has sometimes acted as though he were God and is going to go into that place where angels did the same failing. The failure of mankind is the reality of not acknowledging that it has a creator, that it is a father who loves us, that chooses to minister to us if we accept the reality of what his son has done for us in salvation. We call that atonement, and it means that God chooses to use this type of word at one man to have a unrighteous person like you become a righteous person like Jesus and to meld them together as one being that they become a new creation. The old unrighteousness passed away, the new righteousness has come, and you become a new man, a new Adam, inside, with, and over and through Jesus. It becomes God and man, and man and God. And that's how you're able to understand what we're about to read, what God has written, but what God is saying specifically to you in this chapter. But when man talks, man will go out of his way to use the Bible for his own personal benefits. In this election cycle, you'll hear Christians make the most outrageous, false statements and lies about the scripture and tell other Christians to do as they are doing, which is why God gave to me Romans 12 to bring to your understanding and remembrance how you should act in the election year, but more than that, how you ought to be throughout eternity. Because you see, people like Max Lucado, don't get me wrong, man of God, very inspired, very inspiring, failed in this election year 
to give up his carnality and sacrifice his spirituality for the reality of leading and causing others to stumble in humanism endeavors, which is what political assignment is. When you determine for yourself you're going to vote and that you have chosen a way of voting that is all intellectual and not spiritual. You see, Max Licato didn't come out and say, hey, Christians, all of you, pray to the Lord God Almighty who lives, who was, who ever shall be alive and well and living inside us that Jesus is not dead, but surely he lives and he guides us and has provided with us his Holy Spirit that we could ask God and we would receive, we could seek God and we would find, we can know God and he will give unto us wisdom and knowledge and eternal life to come. No, that sounds good. It sounds like something Max Lucado should have said. It sounds like something that Franklin Graham could have said. It sounds like something that a lot of what they call Trump Christians ought to have said, but they didn't. They said, and they still to this moment will continue to say until the election, why it's okay to vote for Trump even though they may not like the person and his attitudes, his actions, and the things that he's done in the past, they are willing to accept the platform that he operates under, which is kind of a quasi-Republican idea, that somehow he's connected to them when they don't want to be connected to him. That makes it a kind of an interesting hypocrisy. Because you see, in Romans chapter 12, we again are reminded just in verse 1, what are we to be? Living sacrifices. Who are we to serve? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, you present yourselves unto God. So, I don't know where Max Lucado seeks to justify his doctrine. Maybe he doesn't have the Holy Spirit. I don't know. Maybe Franklin Graham is only political, which is why we don't support Franklin Graham as a minister of God at all, but as a man, Sure, he can vote for anything he wants to and get involved in politics all that he wants to. As a humanist, I respect him. Uh, as a Christian, no. He does too much hypocrisy in his ministry to be actually following because while you may go for a prayer meeting, before it's over, he'll be talking politics and his own politics and his own way and agenda of politics. So others may do as they choose to do, but because I'm held accountable for the words of my mouth, for the meditations of my heart, for the actions that I do, the things that I create with my hands, the things that I touch and where my feet have gone to, and even my own personal and secret sins that I commit, I am held accountable, even as Max Licato and Billy uh, Franklin Graham and others who call themselves Trump Christians rather than followers of Jesus may find themselves outside of the will of God. So, what's the will of God? If we're going to say that Max, who made a lot of books, sold a lot of money, or made a lot of money, and probably is on tour circuit, and other pastors, I'm sure that you've heard say, oh, vote for, and then go on to whoever they say. Most Christians will argue the statement that somehow they have to serve the platform of Republicans, because they are supposed to be quote-unquote anti-abortion. But if they were, then they wouldn't be supporting bills that support abortion. Because, you see, democracy isn't about platforms or politicians. Democracy is about compromise. It's about mankind demonstrating his own rule of law to choose to follow what he wants to do according to what he can get away with by the will of the majority supposedly serving the minority which is a reverse of communism, but in reality is the evil part, because you're trusting man to be in control, then what a communal system might be, which is what God is going to create for us. Communism, so to speak. We might call it theocrumanism. In other words, God being that he creates equality within us, which is the reality of being forgiven, then he can determine what is best for us so that we are all equal in his sight. Maybe not our own, but in his sight. 
where some are given a measure of faith and some are given a measure of grace that seems to exceed what others can or can't do. Max Lucado may be getting away with political agendas and serving the God of man rather than the living God. The same true of Franklin in the sense that maybe the grace that's been given to his family extends to Frank. Frankly, I think that they're both in sin. I have no problem saying that according to the scriptures. Because we're not told to go out and vote. We're told to present your bodies a living sacrifice. So we've been talking so far about how come and why people might not get what I'm saying out of the Bible, the Word of God. Because they don't have the Spirit of God within them showing them the same thing that the Spirit of God is showing me. We are told in the same scriptures in 1 Corinthians that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the get dead will administer the gifts or administer the, the fruits of the Spirit severally as he determines and individually as he chooses. So, bottom line is, whether you think you're smart or whether you think you're stupid, neither one is important in the sight of God when he chooses to use you as he desires. So what we're being called to in Romans chapter 12 is to discover the will of God and what our will should be. Because Jesus pretty much summed it up in the shortest possible way you could determine a doctrine to be. And that is, not my will, but thy will be done. Now Christians that don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, that do not talk directly to God and God does not talk directly to them, have a problem because they want to determine God's will by the will of the people. They want to determine God's will by the doctrine of the book, meaning that they'll take something from the Bible, theologically, excise it out of the Bible in the context of the entire scriptures are about Jesus, they'll excise it out, take it out of context, and use it for humanism, political means, militarily, a number of venues that mankind chooses to make the word of God ineffective by playing God in how he determines what the Bible says as opposed to what the Spirit of God is making applicable of the Word of God to you by His Spirit bearing witness with your spirit that you are a son of God and He is speaking to you as a father talks to his son and a son talks to his father. Brethren, we are no longer tossed to and fro with every women doctrine, are we? Or are we? But that we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we might prove what is the perfect and acceptable will of God because we can approach God and ask him, what did you mean with David? Killing. And then you saying, well, he could have had any woman he wanted to. Whoa, God, what's that mean? <laughs> or David praying to dashed little ones on the rocks. In other words, David was pro-abortion. Only his wasn't late term, his was after term abortion. Killing children. That's what David prayed. Go ahead, tell me what you understand, and I'll tell you what God has said. Because you'll find yourself in contradiction unless, and this is the key issue for you, unless you apply the Spirit of God. God does not contradict himself. There's nothing about what the Father said that contradicts what the Son has said. There's nothing about what the Son has said that contradicts what the Spirit says. There's nothing about the Spirit that is going to speak of himself, but he's going to reiterate and bring to your remembrance the things that the Father and the Son have said. Dare I say, the three bear witness of the one. And that is why there is the triune trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that makes it the Godhead, that makes immutable the truth as fact. Because they bear witness of it, of themselves, and in themselves, without mankind ever having to be involved in man's idea of justice and equality. And yet God went out of his way to prove he is just and he is equal. So, all of what you're hearing is what we have been knowing and growing in for a long time in Vidivo Church. 
Because God doesn't want us ignorant in these latter days to be able to answer to every man the reason for the hope that lies within us. Because our folk guy has always been about him and not me. Our focus then is always paying attention to how does the word of God, by the spirit of God, to the people of God, of the son of God, Jesus, become reality for us to live. How do we become Christian? How or if or are we Christian at all? So we're going to read Romans chapter 12, verse 1, and go all the way through the chapter. Now, it's not true that 21 is the end of the chapter. It is the idea that when they wrote the book, in designing it for a printing press, that they came up with numbers in order to keep track of the portions and parts of the Bible that you wanted to find. And even in writing, sometimes they used a certain means of instead of having it without numbers and chapters, they put in numbers and chapters so that you could better find what you were looking for if you didn't already have it written on your heart. See, he who is familiar with the scriptures every day, that it is in their thoughts, in their minds, when they wake up, when they sit down, when they are on the way, when they are walking, when they are talking, when they are visiting, when they are praying, that the book of the law does not depart out of them, but that they do meditate on it always, then of course they don't memorize, they're living it. So it becomes a reality of authorizing or allowing God by speaking it in a way that God honors, that he chooses to use it as powerful and sharp and like a two-edged sword, able to cut asunder the spirit from the soul, the sinew from the muscle, the skeleton from the, you name it. And we can tell you that God will do that if you are accepting that it's God, not me, speaking to you and not only you, but me too. So when we study this, it's not only, as it were, only for the hearer and the doers of the word, but rather for all who would hear from God speaking today. So Father, I thank you that today, not only did I hear your voice and listen and do as you told me to, to come before the people once again at Video Church and to relate that personal information of a relationship that I have with you, but that you have anointed me, appointed me, and called me to preach. That in that way, there should be no excuse for the carnal man who chooses not to follow your will or your plan, but goes about his own way, deciding today to not hear your voice, but to follow the voice of another, the ways of the world. God help us, me first, and I'll be selfish about that, God, because I'm here in front of your people. Anoint and direct me in hearing you by your spirit. What measure of faith is left unto me in these latter days as your spirit is pulling back. And as you have chosen and said, there is no more revivals. We've already had our revival. It's now for us to overcome, to persevere. And so, God, I pray that people would not be caught up in what they want but what your will is for each and every single individual, one by one, as you meet with them and talk to them of your son, Jesus. Today, now, as we go forward in your word, my confident expectation, O oh God, is that you will teach. Is that as I preach, you will allow them who are, in fact, watching, hearing, and knowing you, that they would be encouraged to pursue on godliness in which there is no need to be reminded of sinfulness and that they would determine for themselves individually and then family-wise and then spouse-wise or spouse-wise and then family-wise and then corporate-wise and then city-wise and then church-wise and all the other things. But that in all of these things, we would know that you have called those principalities those powers and that spiritual wickedness in high places to in fact increase and not decrease. For the day is coming when you will pour out your wrath upon all that is ungodly. So God, help us by giving us not less, but more of your spirit. Amen. 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of our God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, what is that acceptable, and what is that perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, to every woman that is listening, to every child and every person, to all of humanity that is human beings, as there is none other that the Creator has made, except that they all have come in the image of His Son, and that they are discovering for themselves what they need to do to become saved, that I say to every one of you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Jesus, and in every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion or proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us all wait on ministering, or he that teaches on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation, and abhor that which is evil, but cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another, with brotherly love, in honor preferring one over another. Not slothful in business or fervent in spirit, but serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of saints and given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that do weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as it lies within your ability to do, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he be thirsty, Give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt reap, or thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Even as it says to the proverb, the same is true to the word. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. When I read this, I recognized that most people will take Romans chapter 12 and skip the beginning. Beseech you therefore, brethren by the mercy of our God, and be not conformed to this world. And they'll move right into the body of Christ. You know, the gifts of the Spirit, the ministering, the loving one another. But I want to ask you, what makes you a Christian? Is it knowing the Bible inside and out, memorizing it, going to church every Sunday? Determining that you are doctrinally collected, correct, that your hermeneutic is on track, that your homiletic is accurate, that you can quote the Ten Commandments, that you are, after all, a fighter for justice, righteousness, persevering to cause Roe versus Wade to be repealed, 
saying to others, oh, I have to protect the babies because God can't do it himself. We have to be God's hands and his feet. Frankly, no. You aren't God's hands and feet. Because God doesn't need you. God allows you to be used sometimes for his purpose. Because you see, there's a day coming when each and every one of us will come before the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are revealed for our duplicity in our humanity by our works being made manifest when put inside of a fire, they are consumed. People like to say, well, nobody will be noticing that and nobody will be there, you know, so you're not going to be embarrassed. Oh yeah, you'll be embarrassed. Yes. Because God will reveal it to eternal beings, not for your humiliation, but for your exaltation. So that no longer would it be so obvious that you were anti gay because you were gay yourself, which is true of a lot of born-again Christians, sadly. Or that you weren't so pushing against abortions because you had an abortion. Or that you weren't so wrapped up in politics because you don't want to have faith and trust in God. You see, God doesn't honor your protest he honors your rest. See, protest is this whole idea of going against the natural order of what God is doing. It goes against the grain of whatever may be you seeing or thinking that God is telling you to do. But when I ask you, as just a simple person, a Christian to Christian, so that my spirit could bear witness with yours that you're doing the right thing, I say to you, did you pray about it? Well, no. It's obvious that we have to. No, it's not obvious. Because that's one of the reasonings that recently in politics people were using. Well, it's obvious we can't vote for Hillary. And I say to you who say it's obvious, what if God says vote for Hillary? Oh, God wouldn't tell me that. Are you sure? Maybe he's telling you that so that you'll get over your vanity of thinking that your party is what God wants you to be a part of. Maybe God wants you to vote for the other person so that he can do something with that person. In other words, what if God doesn't want Hillary in office and then you're told to vote for Trump? And I got one better than all of that because in reality, I don't think that God would tell you to vote for Trump and I don't think God would tell you to vote for Hillary. My personal opinion is that God would tell you, don't vote. Why are you wasting your time in something that is not godly that is not righteous, that is not holy, that is not scriptural, that is not part of God's plan, and then how do you tell me that it's God's will for you to vote? Or even to run for office, for that matter. Now, I understand there are some people that run for office and they call it a Christian candidate. And that's blasphemous to God. Because, no offense, you can be a candidate who happens to be a Christian, but you are not a Christian politician. Because you see, as soon as you get into office, you compromise. You have to make deals. You have to coordinate, supposedly, your ethical, moral compass into accepting that when you put your signed signature on a bill, God holds you accountable. Every idle word spoken, God said, I want you to account for that. So. When you tell me you're a, a voter and you vote for Trump, God says, well, wait a minute. If Trump's a molester or a sexual predator or if he has done these things and you are voting for by putting your signature down, your name down, you're not voting for a party. You are agreeing that it's acceptable to have a person who is not answering the charges before him to Put your witness to and your testimony for and that you are going to stand behind them? Really? I choose Jesus over that. First, foremost, and always. And the same would be true if you are voting for Hillary. You are agreeing that what she may have done or what she hasn't done or whatever may be going on inside of her heart, I don't know. 
or Trump's. But I do know what seems to be uh, evident of what they've done in the past and what people are protesting about for the future, that you're telling me by your vote, you agree with Hillary. You agree with what she's doing and what she's done. And you are agreeing that you are going to be the testimony, the witness, and stand behind her by signing your name on the dotted line. I'd rather stand up for Jesus. <laughs> I got news for you. Politics is easy when it comes to God, to be perfectly honest. He says, make your calling sure. What's your calling? Do you know? I mean, if you're called to the ministry, then make it sure. Make your calling and election confirmed by doing what Jesus said to do. Oftentimes, in these latter days, people say, well, we're choosing the lesser of two evils, and I have to say, I'm not. You may have the measure of faith, maybe, that God has given you that you get to choose the lesser of two evils. But even if you choose the lesser of two evils, doesn't that mean you're condoning evil? Yes, it does. Let me be clear. It does. It means that you are being, as it were, Lot, sparing Sodom and Gomorrah from being destroyed completely, because you are someplace you are not supposed to be. And that God won't wipe you out, but he'll yank you out before he destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as Abraham had to pray that the Lord God would not destroy the city for a certain number of righteous people. And the only righteous was one. And he wasn't quite so righteous as to be holy. But rather, he was dealing with being completely absorbed by the culture and the community that he lived in. So I have to ask you, in a political environment, when you are being tested by the Lord God Almighty of seeking his will, seeking his face, of presenting yourself a willing, living sacrifice as holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service, are you demonstrating that your mind has been renewed, that you can prove what God's will is? and approve what his choices are for you? Or are you disproving and proving the fact that you have not renewed your mind, but you are acting in accordance with the ways of the world, the will of gods in the world, the following the gods of men into that entrapment of getting into total compromise, where you are a part of the parties that are not, in reality, the kingdom of God made manifest in you and I. I grieve. I have read almost everything that a Christian has said about why they can vote for Trump. And I haven't found one that says, I can vote for him because I prayed about it and God told me to. I'd love to hear it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not anti-Trump. I'm not anti-Hillary. I'm not anti-humanism. I'm not anti-government. I'm not anti-voting. I am about one thing, and that is that I present myself unto God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is my reasonable service. And when I am not holy, and when I am not presenting myself, I ask God, stop me, save me, heal me, forgive me, take me where from I am at, and take me where you would have me to go, so that I don't do what mankind wants to do which is self-determination. Let me give you a different word for self-determination. Because self-determination means you get to choose your destiny. You get to choose where you go, what you do, and how to live. It's called freedom, and it is not what God has said. Freedom in America is not something that's protected by the military. Freedom in America is not something that can be maintained by strength of arms, or following the Republicans or Democrats or whatever you think freedom is. Freedom in what mankind is calling free in America is bondage to sin, bondage to the principality that is over America and the spiritual wickedness that is going on in high places in America. And I don't mean conspiracy theories, which has nothing to do with what's wrong or right with America, but in reality of the things that are going on in heaven over the angel that watches over America. 
the messenger that God has for America, that no, it's not from the prophets coming to America and saying they got a word from the Lord. No, they don't, because it's always about prosperity and breakthroughs and presence. And it's not about the simplicity of following Jesus, the reality of hearing his voice, the knowledge that the spirit and the bride are saying, come, not stay. So we who are men of God are weary and being wearied down because we have to have in these latter days the patience of the saints to persevere unto the end when God will reveal, as he did to me just recently, that there are spiritual Christians who either are voting and yet they have prayed or aren't voting because they have prayed. But in reality, both are righteous because both sought the Lord while he may be found and heard from him what God wanted them to do. You see, the Spirit of God can tell one person to vote Trump and another person to vote Hillary because in the life of those individuals, God wants to reveal something about the hardness of the heart and how to change their personal relationship from stumbling after God to having intimate intercourse with God where they can talk to and hear from God himself so that he would speak to them by telling them to go forward or to go back, to go to the left or go to the right, to say to stand up or to sit down, to move according to the will of God led by the Spirit of God to do that which God wants to accomplish in them, which is his will for them to be children of the Most High. Why then? Would a Christian tell you to vote as opposed to telling you who they vote for? Sadly, when Jesus was sitting with his disciples, he told them what was going to happen in the end. And they said, no, no, it won't. And Jesus shook his head at them and rebuked them. As a matter of fact, Jesus told Peter something specifically about what was going to happen. And Peter looked him right in the eye and being that close said, no, we won't let you. And frankly, this is some word for you, O oh Christian. Each and every one of you that tell other Christians how to vote instead of telling Christians to pray, get thee behind me, Satan, period. The Lord rebuke you, Satan, period. Get your eyes on Jesus, period. You've lost your focus. You have no idea of what spirit you are speaking of. There. Now you have a word from the Lord. Now you can go out and test me as a prophet of God if you want to. You can go and examine the word of God and see if it's in alignment with the spirit of God telling you whether I am speaking truth or not. But what if God is? What if God has and what if God is doing as he has promised to do, as you have prayed for, to make you holy, to make you complete, to present you faultless before the Father with exceeding joy, then maybe elections and the selection process isn't about the obvious practicalities of casting a vote, but rather maybe it's determining where your angst is, where your unction comes from where your self-determination, your declaration of, I'm free, I want to make America great again, has fallen far from the reality of God shed his grace on me. You see, America has never been great. America has been a country that God shed his grace on. God shed his grace on America in the beginning. And so a certain number of people that were businessmen, and politicians and served God, some of which they had made up their own kind of God and some of which were following the best they knew of God, declared to come unto a self-rule that they chose to make as a utopian society that they hoped God would honor. In 200 years plus, maybe 250, we've proven that it doesn't work. Democracy in its purest form would not be what we have. We have a republic that has democratic principles that apply itself to the majority 
making the laws that are over the minority that it could very easily abuse and frankly take advantage of. Because while we have a judiciary to help circumvent that happening to the minority, what if the minority determines what the majority believes? Have we not in some ways done that through political means with Supreme Court decisions? I know that this world is not my home. I also realize that this country I live in is a foreign land to me, that I am a foreigner passing through, and that my citizenship is not American, but that it is as a son of God. I am here as a missionary bringing you the great news of God that has come down to you for the good news of salvation, that the gospel would be made known to you, that you would no longer be living according to the measure of faith that allows you to be carnal and caught up and blinded by the God of this world, but that you would come out from among them, even while living in this life that you have been given, but you would determine that you don't want your will to be done anymore, but God's will. That you would choose you this day whom you would serve, whether the gods of men in the political maneuverings, or the gods of man, the God of man, the holy God, the creator of the universe, the God that told all the people, come up here. And they said, oh no, Moses, you go up there. We'll listen to what you have to say. And they didn't. And they still haven't. Because God wanted all the people to be Moses's. God wanted all the people to be Abraham's. God wants all the people to become Isaac that you would lay down and let your father bind you as a living sacrifice to the altar. In Hebrew, we call it the Al-Qaeda. Not Al-Qaeda, but the A-Q-U-I-E-D-A, -E the binding of Isaac. And what that means is kind of like carrying your cross. It's the same principle that you would no longer have your freedom to choose your own will and way and self-determination of where you'll be in eternity, but that you have given that over, that choice, to the one who can choose for you adequately. And that is God. That you now understand the proverb 3, 5, and 6, which says to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean in your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him. And let Him direct your path, because if He's not directing, then you are, and you're deceived. You're like Peter, who was being used by Satan at that time and being inhabited or harassed by demonic activity that might be spiritual wickedness, it might be a principality, it might be a power, it might be your own vanity causing you to not step away from the politics and step forward for the gospel's sake. Keith Green said, I pledge my head to heaven for the gospel's sake. I ask no man on earth to fill this need. But like the sparrows up above, I am enveloped in his love. And he feeds them like the little ones. So, my question to you, if you are in fact a Christian, what makes you Christian? Why are you Christ-like? We now have seen in Romans chapter 1 and 2, I mean Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, what you should do. And we've seen in the rest of the chapter how there are many parts. And some are going to say, well, yeah, but there's also a Christian politician. I'm going to say, no, there's not. That's not what it says there. And, you know, some other time we'll go into that part if you want to. You know, We'll discuss the body of Christ and try to find where politics is the body of Christ. You know, the bride of Christ, that somehow politics applies. There isn't any politics in heaven. There's obedience or disobedience. There's his will or your will. Frankly, I'd rather not have my will. And I don't want to let you off the hook to just simply throw that, you know, little hook blind and sinker on the end of your prayer by saying, but God, not my will, I will be done, but I want this. Well, I got a warning for you from the Lord. 
pretty easy that it came from Chuck Smith and some of the others, Spurgeon and Tozer and um, i trying to think of the other one. That I, of, oh, uh, Blackaby, I think, wrote about it once. Um, even uh, Ravenhill. But watch what you pray for. You might get it. In other words, just because you ask and God gives it to you, that doesn't mean that's his will. The people came together and said, Samuel, we are wanting to have a king like all the other nations. Samuel was offended, hurt. And he came to the Lord and God said, look, Samuel, it's not your fault. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Dare I say, let me be specifically clear to every American Christian that thinks that Christianity is a political environment you can get into as a Christian politician and that you can somehow sacrifice your personal relationship with God and the gospel by going into the political arena and thinking that you're going to come out holy, you're not. God has said and God has determined that the people cannot choose for themselves how to live. In reality, God says, as he did to Moses, get down there, man of God, for they have sinned a great sin and I'm ready to destroy them. I got news for you. America hasn't been around long enough to use up the grace that it's been given. It's barely a baby when it comes to nations. But Christians, oh my God, do you really want to become a vassal of Satan? A puppet used by the God of this world to promote democracy? You see, democracy was already taken overseas and presented in the Middle East to, you know, some countries. And they said, okay, we'll vote. And they voted democracy out and they voted a dictator in. That shows you what sometimes older nations think of democracy. They didn't want the people to decide. They wanted someone to be held accountable. Today we have a fascinating thing in the elections by supposedly all these people saying, well, you know, Hillary will do this, that, and the other thing. As though she were becoming the dictator of America, not a president that still has to answer to Congress, the House of Representatives, and the judiciary. And the same thing true of Trump. Well, Trump's going to do this, that, and the other thing. Well, they act like he's a dictator that's going to be moving into something called the presidency that actually doesn't have to do what Congress says or the House of Representatives says or that the Supreme Court has any influence over. Every political year, people lie about what these men and women that are running for office actually can really do. Oh, they can say they have promises and you know agendas and all this other stuff, but I've been around for 50 years not voting. At least seeing that every time I prayed for them, whoever won, but every time they didn't do what they said they would do. Congress or political parties or compromises would come about and they would, you know, try to get some kind of, you know, memorial for themselves out of their office time, you know, being in office. We're told that if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, that I would hear their cry and I would answer their prayer. Blah, blah, blah. And so we had some political agendas going around the country using that as some kind of gamesmanship in order to get votes and voters to go out and vote. And it was evil to do that. I got a word for you from the Lord. Don't go out. Don't go to church. Don't go anywhere, any day, any way that you choose to until you go into your prayer closet, even as that prayer room or whatever that was out, I don't know, the war room, I guess. I never saw the movie. I probably won't. But I want to say it this way. Instead of going into your prayer closet or hiding away someplace and having you know, all these tactical plans, maneuvers, why not just go someplace quiet? Why not just be intimate and real with Jesus today? Why not take the time to pray for your measure of faith to be increased, that you might have 
whatever it takes to get your earwax removed that you could oh you are speaking and hear God speak or oh you do appear out of nowhere wow Lord and he meets you face to face or oh God I feel so humble so touched so overwhelmed by what you're saying to me that it's got to be you I would never have thought that I would never have said that I surely would never have felt that because that is what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 12 he isn't really talking about you know go out and buy some rope you know tie your hands and feet and lay down on an altar and have someone hold a knife over you no, that's not what Paul's saying. Being a living sacrifice isn't just simply you know, taking his flesh and saying, ah, I could accomplish in the will of God and name it and claim it and that, you know, I exercise regularly so I got bodybuilding, you know, muscles that I could go out and do something for God. You know, football, baseball, you know, childish games that I'm declaring as being the will of God for me, that God's will is, after all, I can use that fame and fortune in order to be a minister of God. Right. Right. I'm sure you can. But really, Paul is just simply saying, hey, I don't care what you do. I care who you do it with. Because if you're doing it without seeking the Lord, then you're doing it with Satan on your shoulder. You're doing it with the God of this world in your heart. You're doing it against what God would have. God wants you. God loves you. God chose you for salvation. But determining that realization of salvation in your life, though once saved, always saved, is something that people argue about and talk about and present all these debates about, all these ways of choosing to somehow apply their understanding to what they think the Word of God says. Well, the Bible also says that if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. The Bible also says that if you're a goat, you don't go in. I mean, there's a lot about salvation that is true that you can be and rest assured if you meet that criteria of being fearful or subject to the nervousness of, as Paul said, I pray to be counted worthy that after having preached the gospel, I be found a castaway, lest I be so, I beat my body down so that I would not be held, what, as a unprofitable servant, but rather made into a vessel of honor, that God would call me his child. No one is righteous. And if Paul himself... Being that type of Jew, that type of son of God, that type of Christian, ministering to the Gentiles and to the Jew and to us, then what ought we to be and what manner of people ought we to be if we are now trying to change history by saying somehow that the first 300 years was not about people being nonviolent or not about people being subject to persecution and not about people blessing their enemies and not about people being poor in spirit or on and on and on. But rather we've come to a conclusion in our modern day America that the American Jesus that you see a picture of is somehow that Jesus that we want, like the Mormons, reinventing him into something and someone that isn't the Son of God, the Son of Man. Or are we willing to lay down our life as a living sacrifice on the altar of prayer? Pray. Pray always. Pray personally. Pray individually. But for God's sake and for your own, pray. You never know, but God might come through and have something to say to you.